Friends, this is our third in a series of videos where we consider the evangelistic task of the church in light of our current events. In other words, how do we reach the lost while sheltered at home? Our first video, just as a quick review, was an introduction to 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 17, and in particular, trying to answer the question, what is our hope amid changing times, what is our hope, which is an unchanging God, an unchanging Savior, an unchanging gospel, and an unchanging promise of gospel fruitfulness. Our second video, we considered what gospel fruitfulness looks like in our homes, and today we're going to consider what gospel fruitfulness looks like in our prayer life. Uh, this is maybe a diversion from 1 Peter 3. I think it's a helpful diversion, though, and I think we find some of what we need in Matthew 9, which reminds us of the responsibility to pray for the harvest. And so let's look at those verses just briefly. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 35. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, just a couple quick points from this passage. First of all, there's a fundamental truth that drives this passage, and that truth is simply this, that the God that we serve is the Lord of the harvest. The harvest belongs to him. Any fruitfulness in the harvest is because of him. So it's his harvest. That should give us great confidence as we do the work of evangelism. But we also see a fundamental promise that the harvest is plentiful. And that should direct our prayers. They should be expectant, faith-filled prayers. We expect the Lord to do mighty things through the witness and testimony of the church. But there's a third thing we see in this passage, and that is a fundamental need. There's a need for laborers. The harvest is so plentiful that there aren't enough workers to gather it in. And so he calls us then in response to that great need to pray. It's interesting, isn't it? We might expect him to say go, but in particular in this passage he calls us to pray. And who are we praying to? It brings us right back to that fundamental truth. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. We need to remember the one to whom we pray. He is the God who is faithful, who makes promises and always keeps them. And he's promised a plentiful harvest. So we can pray big prayers, expectant prayers. We can, we can assume, because the Bible tells us it's true, that God will do great things in gathering many people into the church. The first video I read from a, a, a chapter that was written by Jack Miller in which he describes God as the one who's in the business of doing much. He's exercising great power, and when the Holy Spirit is at work, there's a great harvesting plan that he is accomplishing. So we can pray with expectation. We can expect there to be a plentiful harvest, and we can expect to be a part of it, to participate in it, and to expect to see fruit, which in this case means, in particular, souls converted. People made ready to respond. People who must respond. Because when they hear the voice of their shepherd, they recognize his voice, and they have to follow him. So we should be asking ourselves this question, I think. What do you expect from prayer? This has been my experience quite often, and maybe it'll be familiar to you. At a moment of spiritual struggle, or at a moment where something large is looming in front of me, I go to a Christian friend, and I ask them for advice. What should I do? And what do they say to me? Well, you should pray. And I think to myself, of course I should pray, but what should I do? You should pray. We should expect big things when 
The voice, voices of the people of God are joined together in prayer. Prayer is active kingdom warfare. It's arms locked in battle. It's people fit for battle. Who've been fit by Christ with all the armor and weapons necessary to compete in the battlefield. And it's a battle where the victory has already been won. And how do we know the victory has been won? Because we serve a risen Savior who's seated at the right hand of God. And so we can pray with expectation. One of my favorite examples of prayer in the scriptures in Acts 4 verses 23 through 31. This is a prayer that's filled with expectation of what God will do. Peter and John have just been released from prison. They were arrested for preaching the gospel. Their lives were threatened, and, and they expect that their lives are on the line now. They've been told, stop preaching the gospel. And it's interesting what they do immediately. First of all, what they do is it says they went to their friends. And who are their friends? The church, other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. When their lives are on the line, instead of running away, they go to the church. And then they have a big prayer meeting. They cry out to God. This big prayer that reflects on the greatness of their God. He's the sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. He's the God who works even through difficult, painful providences to accomplish his purposes. Even as they pray in Acts 4, even when the nations and the rulers attack the anointed one, Jesus Christ, and put him to death. God is at work even in those events to accomplish his purposes. And in the midst of that, they pray for boldness, that they would persevere in speaking the gospel. And how do you think God answered that prayer? He answered immediately. It says that as they asked for the Lord to do wondrous works, to show himself at work among them, that the room in which they were sitting started to shake. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and with boldness they kept on speaking the gospel. That's really the pattern of the book of Acts. The people of God pray, and God works in and through them, and the gospel advances. So we should be praying big, expectant, evangelistic prayers, knowing what God has promised to do and expecting Him to fulfill his promises. I want to read briefly from uh, J.C. Ryle. This is from his expository thoughts on the Gospel of Matthew, and this is in particular reflecting on that call to pray in Matthew 9. And this is what he says, two paragraphs. I think they're really helpful. He says, Let us mark that there is a solemn duty incumbent on all Christians who would do good to the unconverted part of the world. They are to pray for men to be raised up to work for the conversion of souls. It seems as if it was to be a daily part of our prayers. He goes on to say, If we know anything of prayer, let us make it a point of conscience never to forget this solemn charge of our Lord. Let us settle it in our minds that it is one of the surest ways of doing good and stemming evil. Personal working for souls is good. Giving money is good. But praying is best of all. By prayer we reach him without whom work and money are alike in vain. We obtain the aid of the Holy Ghost. And he goes on to write that money can pay agents, universities can give learning, congregations may elect, bishops may ordain, but the Holy Ghost alone can make ministers of the gospel. And the Holy Ghost alone can raise up lay workmen in the spiritual harvest who need not be ashamed. And then he concludes with this sentence, Never, never may we forget that if we would do good to the world, our first duty is to pray. Our first duty, if we would long to see good in the world, is to pray. So let's do that. In our families, as we're at home together, let's Pray as individuals in our time of quiet. Let's pray. Let's pray big prayers, expectant, 
faith-filled prayers, specific prayers that souls will be gathered into the kingdom of God. And as we finish, let me just give you a few things that we should be praying for. First of all, we should pray for a big harvest. And we can pray that with confidence because it's what the Lord promised. We should pray for a big harvest, but we should also pray for a local harvest. In other words, not just that there would be souls gathered in China or Africa, but that there would be souls gathered in Philadelphia through the ministry of Calvary Church. So we should pray for a local harvest. We should pray as well for laborers, both that the Lord would raise up laborers, that he would raise up ministers and elders to do the, the work of the ministry, but also that he would raise up willing servants, believers like us, who love Jesus and who want to speak of Jesus to their family and friends. And let us pray that those laborers would be effective, would have all the gifts and resources they need to be effective instruments in the gathering of the harvest. And then let's pray that the Lord would change us. And what do I mean by that? That he would change us and make us faithful laborers means this. First of all, let's confess our sins. Those times when we've given up opportunities to claim the name of Jesus and to speak of our Savior. Let's pray that God would replace the fear that so quickly discourages us from speaking. Replace that fear with confidence in God and what he would do through us. And let's pray that the Lord would give us new eyes, eyes that are compassionate, that see the world as those who deserve our love and are worth knowing, that see our neighbors as those who without Christ are lost. They don't know their right hand from their left. They're sheep without a shepherd. And let's pray that they would come to know the shepherd and that we would have an opportunity to tell them about the shepherd. Brothers and sisters, we have lots of time on our hands right now. Most of us do. Lots of time. Let's use that time well. Let's pray big, faith-filled, expectant prayers because we're praying to a big, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, all-powerful God who loved us so much that he sent his Son into the world to save sinners. Let's pray that those that we know would know him as their Savior. And let's be ready to speak as those who know him as our Savior.